Let's take what we've just been talking about and try and implement some of these practice exercises. So the only way to get good at programming in a particular programming language is to, is to write programs in that language. So you can read all the books you want and you can do tutorials and, but honestly, the best thing you can do is just sit down and try and write little functions, try and get some code to work, push yourself to, you know, get, experience working with a particular uh, programming language. So let's do this with JavaScript. I've got a whole bunch of them here. I've just picked some at random and I've got a JavaScript file and I have a terminal that I'm going to work with inside of Visual Studio Code. By the way, when you're in Visual Studio Code, you can create a new terminal and <clears throat> you can run your JavaScript program without having to leave um, Visual Studio Code. So I'll do uh, I'll do a bit of both of them. Both here, all in one, all in uh, in one window. So the first one I thought I would do is number eight. Pretty simple one. We want to create a function that generates a name for um, a JavaScript library. So it's typical for JavaScript libraries to end with .js, and so we want to be able to create. So if I give you the string dog, I want to get back. Um, I want to get back dog.js. Okay, so let's try this. So let's first of all try writing this as a function declaration. So notice that the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use some kind of an action name for my when I'm naming this thing. So I am going to generate a name. We could, you know, we could make this longer, generate js name, whatever you want to call it, but something that says what it does. And you'll also notice that I'm using camel case. So I didn't do generate name like that, and I'm not doing capital G, capital N. I want to do lowercase first, camel case, like so. And we're going to pass in a name, and we want to get back a value that you know looks like something.js. OK, so what we could do is we could return back uh, the name plus .js. So that could be our first implementation of this. And we could try this out. So if I said let name is equal to um, web222, and I could say console.log name, and I'm also going to log generate name, and I'm going to pass it in my variable name like so. And if I save this, and if I were to run this, remember we run a JavaScript program using Node. I have to be in the same directory as, as where I'm working on this, obviously, but Node functions.js. It prints out web222 and web, whoops, I need another two. And the same name.js. Okay, that's pretty good. So what if we rewrote this as a function expression? So I'm going to comment my code here. This was the uh, function declaration. How does that code differ if we do it as an expression, a function expression? Well, I'm going to say let generate name is equal to a function expression, function name return name plus dot js like so and now i'm at the end of defining my expression so i'm going to put a semicolon right there like that save this let's see if it works so you can see that both of those two different versions of writing this function work the same way i can write it as a function declaration or i can write it as a function expression. Both of them are good. Just out of interest, let's rewrite it a third time. How does this look different if we, so let's move this up here. This is my function expression. How would it look different if I rewrote it as an arrow function? Well, I can probably fit this thing on one line because what I'm doing here is I'm saying I want to get rid of the function keyword. I want to add 
this fat arrow. And because the only thing I'm doing is returning, I'm going to get rid of the return statement. And I'm going to get rid of this function body. And I'm going to write it like that. Let's see if that works. So if I were to run that program, I also get the same value. So we have different styles for being able to write these functions. Um, let's go back to our, so this is the arrow function version. Let's modify this program just a little bit. So what if I passed in a string that looked like this? What if it already had a dot in it? Well, that's kind of ugly because now I have this extra dot. So could I improve on this program? I, well, I could. I could, I, could do, I could do this a number of ways. I could say if name.ends with, we're going to be talking about how to work with strings more uh, in the coming weeks, but strings have a method ends with. So I could say if it ends with a dot, then what do I want to do? I want to return the name plus JS without a dot. Otherwise, down here, else return this. So we could try writing the program like that. Does that work? So that's pretty good. So now we only get a single dot. Uh, what if we didn't have a dot? Would it work? Yep, so that works as well. Now this code we could clean up a little bit. Notice that we've got a bunch of repetition here. And also I want you to notice that I'm using multiple return statements, which I told you, contrary to what you've been taught in other classes, multiple return statements are just fine. But I want you to watch out for a pattern here. Anytime you return in an if, you no longer need the else. So if I return here, it means that I'm no longer going to execute any of the rest of this code. So I can make this code simpler by getting rid of the else and rewriting the code like this. So if the name ends with this, we're going to exit the function and we're going to return this value. If it doesn't, we're going to do this. We could simplify this even a little bit more. Maybe we could say that we want to return one of two things depending on whether name ends with a dot. So we could use the ternary operator if we wanted to. We could say return name plus JS or return name with the dot and the JS. We could do something like that. So various ways that we could write this function to make this, uh, to make it work. Okay, let's do, let's do another one of these. Um, how about this one, number 10? Check if a number is between two other numbers, being inclusive if the final argument is true. So I want to check if the number 66 is between 1 and 50, and I want to be inclusive. That is, it could be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 50, and it could include 50. Okay, let's, let's try that. So I want to write a function, check between. Takes a whole bunch of arguments. What should I call these arguments? Well, when I'm naming my arguments, I want to be as clear as I can with what they are. So I want to check um, some value. I want to check if this value is between some low number and some high number. And furthermore, I want to possibly be inclusive when I do that check. OK, let's think about how we're going to do this. So how would we do this if we weren't being inclusive? Well, we could say return is the value greater than the low, and is the value less than the high. 
So we could do something like that. So if I were to do console.log check between, and if we were to pass in 66, 1, 50, uh, and let's say true, if we were to run this, we get false because 66 is not between those two. What if I change this to six? I would expect that to return true and it does return true. So that's good. Okay, so let's think about, we're not using this inclusive argument right now. So would, let's just check something. Would this work if I didn't pass in the fourth argument? Yeah, so that made no difference. So remember that when I am writing a function, I can accept more arguments than you pass or I can pass more arguments than you want. So there's, there is a real freedom between the two of those things. I don't know if you can tell this, but because in my editor inside Visual Studio Code, I have a whole bunch of extensions installed. One of those extensions is ESLint that I have installed, and I've, I've suggested that you install ESLint in yours as well. Um, can you see that this variable has a different color than this variable? Can you see how it's lighter in color? And if I hover over it, you can actually see that there is a warning. It says inclusive is declared, but its value is never read. So this is often a sign of a bug. When you have a variable that you declare and you don't use, it's, it's, not, it's not good. It probably means that I either need to use this variable or I should delete it. I, I need to do one or the other of the two. I shouldn't just leave something that I don't use. So this is an example currently of dead code. This, is, this variable is dead. We should prune it. It's like weeding a garden. You shouldn't let all these, you know, these things grow in your garden that you don't want there. So let's think about how we could use inclusive. So what I would like to do is I might say, if inclusive, then I want to uh, return value is greater than or equal to low and value is less than equal to high. So I could do something like this. So what would this do right now? What, what, if, I, what if I passed in true? What would that do? So that works. What if I change this to the number 50? If I look to see if 50 is between one and 50 and I'm being inclusive, I would expect that to return true, it does. What if I change this to false? Okay, so now it says, no, it's, it's not, that's not gonna work. Now, what if I don't pass anything here? What would the program do then? So think about what this would mean. So if I came into the program now, value is equal to 50, low is equal to one, 50 is equal to high, and what is inclusive e to equal? Well, let's, let's check it out. So I'm gonna console.log value, low, high, and inclusive. I'm gonna print out what all of those values are so that we can see what's going on. And I'm gonna rerun this code so you can see here I have 50, 1, 50, and then I have, it's very light, maybe hard to see on the video, but it's undefined. So this value, there's nothing there. So remember that we said that JavaScript allows us to work with truthy and falsy values. Let's go back to the console for a second. So if I were to say, is undefined truthy or Falsy, while well, undefined is basically false. What else is false? Null is false. Zero is false. The empty string is false. Uh, not a number is false. There's a number of things that are false and other things are true. So if I have the number one, it's true. If I have the string one, it's true. If I have, um, the word true, it's true, etc. 
So when you're writing your functions in JavaScript, sometimes what you want to do is you want to, sometimes you want to work directly with a value. So you want to say, for example, if inclusive is equal equal to true. So we could do that. Um, but you often don't do this in JavaScript. Now let me ask you another question. What does it mean to use equal equal here as opposed to equal equal equal? Do you remember? So equal equal means that it will try and coerce these two arguments so that they are comparable, right? And so it's going to use truthy and falsy values. Equal 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 is going to say that this has to be exactly true. It has to be this one and only thing on, you know, that one are, um, that one value. So it's very common in JavaScript programs to just do that, to just say if inclusive. And what this means is if inclusive is truthy, as long as it's, as long as it exists, as long as it's, it has been defined, then we want to be able to do this. So this lets us do some interesting things where instead of passing in false, like so, which would be valid, I could do this, I can also just pass nothing. And so it's very common in JavaScript for functions to take different number of arguments depending on the situation that you find yourself in. People will write code where they check to see if certain arguments are defined or not. Are they truthy or not when they're, when they're going through and looking at it? Okay, good. Um, Let's do another one. Uh, what would be a good one here? Here's one, number 18. A function to log all the arguments that are larger than 255. So they have a show outside byte range, 15, 233, 255, 256, 0. And it should log 256 because it's a number that is outside of 0 to 255. So basically, can we, can we um, log all of the all of the numbers that are outside of the byte range that we expect. Okay, let's try this. So this time, let's write this as a function expression. Let show outside byte range equals a function. Now let me ask you, what should I put for arguments here? I want this to work for one, two, three, four, five, 10, 100. I want it to work for any number of arguments. So if we don't know how many arguments we're gonna get, we typically don't put a value here. We're just gonna leave that empty. And this is a function expression, so I'm gonna put a semicolon at the end of my function expression here. Notice that I don't have a name. I don't have a name because I'm going to bind this function object to this variable right here. So that's why there's no name here. All right, so let's think about how we would do this. What I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to loop through all of the arguments and I'm gonna check if they are larger than 255. If they are, I'm gonna print them out. Okay, so we need a for loop. So I'm gonna say for let i is equal to zero i is less than, what's it called, do you remember? So I wanna be able to get all of the arguments that are here, that's exactly what it's called. Arguments is this uh, variable that exists, I don't define it, it's just available in the context of this function. I'm gonna increment i. So now I have a loop, it's gonna go through all of these arguments and what I wanna do is I want to grab the current value that we're gonna go through. So let's just go down here for a second. So if I said show outside byte range and I passed in one, five, 233, 255, 256, and zero like that, I wanna work with each one of these numbers, one, five, and so on. So I'm gonna say let value is equal to arguments at i like so. The way that let works in JavaScript, this value that we're defining here is going to have block scope. If we used var, 
If I said var here, which you'll see lots of programs do, then it's going to have function scope, which we'll talk about a little bit in, in the next video, I'll talk about scope. So be careful of that. So I'm gonna use let, let value equals arguments at i, and I'm gonna say if the value is greater than 255, then log it to the console. Otherwise, do nothing and continue on from there. So I'm gonna save this, let's see if it works. So this thing prints out 256. If I had another, if I had the number 300 and I reran it, I get 256, 300. So this is working the way that I expect it to work. Okay, could we do anything, could we change anything here? What if, um, Instead of using arguments, we could use that rest parameter that I was showing you. So one, one thing we could do is we could say dot, dot, dot values like this. And that would let me get rid of arguments and use values dot length. And here I would say values at i, etc. So slight modification to the code. Does it work the same way? It does. So you can choose when you're going through here which way which way you want to write this in order to have it work. And I think the, you know, the way you're gonna decide one versus the other is you're going to, you know, in terms of how you're documenting it. One other thing that I'm not doing in this program, but I want you to be aware of, is that with these rest parameters, it's also possible for you to have a few named arguments at the beginning, A and B, and then you can take the quote unquote, the rest of the parameters and call them values. So it's a way for you to you know, define a few and then have a bunch of them that go here. Um, so let's say for example, we wanted to define a range, show outside of a range. And let's say that we wanna have a low and we wanna have a high, and then we wanna have a series of values. So for example, Let's say that I wanna look for all the numbers between zero and 255, and then these are my numbers right here, okay? So I've modified this program slightly so that the first two arguments, low and high, represent the range that I wanna check for. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna say if the value is, if it's less than the low, or, if the value is greater than the high, then I want to log it like so. So if I had, let's do negative five, which is below zero. Let's do a couple of numbers that are above it. Let's try running this. Whoops, show, oh, I, got, I changed my function name. So now I'm seeing all of the values that are outside of the range that I defined. So I'm able to have a few named parameters and I'm also able to have this unlimited list of parameters that are the rest of the parameters that I wanna be able to work with when I'm coming in here. Okay. So let's, let's try another one. Um, how about this one, number 11? So a function to calculate the HST or calculate the tax on a purchase amount. All right, this is an interesting one. Let's write this a number of ways. So let's do function calculate HST. I'm gonna pass in an amount. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to return the amount times 0 0.13. So if the amount of tax is 13%, I want to calculate, you know, so if I were to console.log, um, let's say uh, 25 and calculate HST on 25. Right, so 25 and 3.25 in, in tax. Okay, that's interesting. 
So what if we were writing this program and we wanted this program to be um, a little bit more intelligent? Um, we wanted it so that if the tax rate changes, like in my lifetime, the Canadian tax rates have changed many, many times. So if I wrote a program and I hard coded in this value, that might work for a while and then it might be difficult for people to maintain because they have to go and they have to, like we have this assumption baked into our code that the tax is always 0 0.13. So what else could we do? Well, one thing we could do is we could pass in 0 0.13 like this. So I could say, um, I could accept a second argument, percent, like so, and I could multiply it like that. Presumably this is gonna give me the same result. It does give me the same result. Um, but imagine that we have been using this code, we're calling this function in many, many places, and some of the places didn't used to have a percent that they got passed in. So imagine you're working uh, on a huge program, thousands of files, and this calculate HST function is used in hundreds of places. And in some places, they're using the new method where they're passing in a tax percentage, and in other places, they aren't using it, and so we have a problem. All right, so what could we do? Well, there's a number of ways we could we could try and solve this problem. So one thing we could do is we could check. We could say if we don't have a percent. So think about this for a second. What is the value of percent here? It's undefined, right? And what's the value of percent here? It's 0 0.13. So if I don't have an argument here, I'm basically saying this is this value is undefined, right? I'm expecting something but I'm getting nothing. So instead of saying if percent equals undefined, it's much more common for you to just say if not percent. So in other words, if percent is falsy, if, if we don't have something we can work with here. Or another way you might do this, you could say if not um, type of percent is equal to a number, you could do something like that too. I'm gonna to keep it simple. I'm just gonna say, if we don't have a percent, then what should we do? Well, one thing we could do is we could define a default. So we could say percent is equal to 0 0.13. Or if I was really being clever, up here at the top of my program, I could document this and I could say const default tax rate is equal to 0 0.13. And down here, I could say that I'm going to use the default tax rate in my calculations like so. So this, if I were to run this, what do I get? So that works now. So in the, in the first case, I don't pass in a value. In the second case, I do pass in a value. And my function is smart enough to operate on, on both versions of it. Okay, let's rewrite this in a more idiomatic JavaScript way. So what you'll see a lot of people do is they will, instead of doing an if statement, they'll write their code like this. Okay, think about that for a second. What does that, what does that mean? So we're saying take percent and set it equal to the result of this expression. So remember what an expression is. An expression is a statement that's going to evaluate down to a single value. So this expression says either percent is truthy or default tax rate. So one of the two of these we're going to use. Okay. So let's, let's just try, let's just go over here for a second. So if I said, um, undefined or 0 0.13, what does it give me? It gives me 0 0.13 because that's defined. What if I had null over here? Okay, it gives me 0 0.13. What if I had the number five? Well, then it's gonna give me five. So it's gonna to evaluate to whichever one of these two is 
a truthy value. We're, we have a default value here, which is our default tax rate, and percent is equal. So it's checking to see if it's if percent has a value, use the value. So you're sort of you're assigning that value to itself. So it won't do anything, it won't change anything if percent has been defined. But if percent has not been defined, then it's going to substitute the default tax rate, and then this calculation can proceed. Like that. So if we wanted to, we could also do this. We could also say multiply it by whichever one of these, whichever one of these is truthy. Okay, so that's another another way we could do this. So there's one other thing we could do here. So newer versions of JavaScript have added the ability for us to define default values for our parameters. So up here, instead of doing this, I could say, um, I, could, I could put a default value. So a default value is gonna allow me here to say, percent is equal to 0 0.13, or I could say is equal to default tax rate. And then I don't have to do anything inside the body of the function. So if I want to specify that if the user doesn't provide a value, so if that is undefined, then what's going to happen is it's going to use the, it's going to use the value that comes in here. So I could save this and I could rerun and I get, I get back that value. So what I would encourage you to do, I'm going to, I'm going to pause this discussion here. I have one more video that I want to make just to talk to you about scope and about closures. But I would encourage you to work your way through some of these functions and just practice some of the things that we're talking about. None of these functions is really hard, but, and they're all gonna be quite small functions. You wanna aim for small functions that just do one thing, something that's easy to reason about, but try practicing writing function expressions, writing function declarations, try using the arguments, uh, using arguments to loop over a set of arguments, Try setting default values or defining them manually as I did with the or syntax and get comfortable with working with um, what's going on here.